Right, well, if this next session isn't a hot topic, I don't know what it is. Um, Ofsted's newly revised framework is based on research that shows that metacognition is one of the things that can be most effective in raising learners' attainment. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Colin Hill. Can we give him a round of applause, please? when it's uh, lunch time in this busy arena. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard about metacognition uh, and what impact it can have on schools uh, and classrooms around the world. I've got an immense task today. The next 30 minutes I'm going to somehow try and explain the whys, what's and how's of metacognition. I've got to do that in 30 minutes. It normally takes me two hours, so if I'm speaking very fast, I'm sure you'll forgive me. Um, by way of introduction, um, my name is Colin, I'm, one, I'm the founder of UK EdChat. You may be aware of, the, of our presence on social media, um, but we have a website, we have the UK Ed magazine, and we also have um, the UK Ed podcast as well, which goes out to hundreds of thousands of people each time uh, something's released. I worked in, as a primary school teacher until 2011, um, took time to leave the profession then to work with a, uh, shall we say, a media organisation in London for a couple of years before um, setting out to UK Ed Chat along with my colleague Martin Burt, who's ICT Magic, and uh, we've been doing that ever since. Now, along with my um, research project at the University of Glasgow, I've been studying uh, metacognition because it was becoming one of those topics which I heard a lot of in UK chat, but I wasn't really understanding what it actually meant and more importantly how to implement it in the classroom. So my research interests altered to ever so slightly towards metacognition. So let's have a look at some of the key reasons why metacognition is so important. And um, I actually did an article a few months ago offering 12 reasons why teachers in schools should implement metacognition in the classroom book, and that's what this part of the session was um, listed as. However, I've tried to condense it into four uh, main reasons. Firstly, I'm sure most of us here have heard of um, John Hattie, uh, the, you know, the New Zealand Professor of Education, who's done the meta-analyses of um, pedagogical um, studies around the world that create uh, greatest impact. In his 2018 work, um, along with Klaus Seiler, um, Hattie found that metacognition has an impact score of 0.69. Wow, but well, what does that actually mean? When all said and done, through all his studies, Hattie found that the central point for each year of a student's academic attainment should be at 0.4. Any pedagogical programmes or interventions that fall less than that are down here and any of the pedagogical um, programmes which prove um, a higher impact are on that side of this um, chart. You can see here where metacognition fits into that at 0.69 and yes it is just outside the top 10. And you can see all the top 10 here, don't worry, you all these slides are available online after this presentation. And a lot of people say to me, Colin, that's all very well, so why aren't we concentrating on one of these programmes or interventions or pedagogical practices that are within the top 10? Well, the reason for that is thanks to the second reason, and that was um, that was highlighted by the Education Endowment Foundation here in the UK, who found that metacognition offers a high impact for a very low cost. Whereas a lot of the programmes which I showed a moment ago, yes, you can implement that, but there is a greater cost to the school and to the teachers. However, the Education um, Endowment Foundation found that it's a very low cost. Yet, to once you start to understand 
metacognitive uh, procedures, then there isn't a lot of cost there. Thirdly, Singapore. Uh, the OECD um, have ranked Singapore quite regularly towards the top of international tables, and they've actually implemented metacognition into mathematic, math mathematical teaching since the early 2000s. Their results speak for themselves. Other research that I found also suggests that uh, metacognition supports independent learning, problem solving, and also helps improve study skills. Okay, I, I think with metacognition is about this full piece of metacognition which we need to consider for thinking of implementing it into a school. Patients planning persistence and permanence. Basically, metacognition is not a quick fix. You've got to plan for it. I would suggest that if you're aiming to get your pupils to do GCSEs this summer, that you don't start a metacognition programme with them now. It takes time. It's like a change of culture within the school and within the classroom. It does take planning. Uh, there's going to need to be some persistence from the school and the teaching staff to ensure that they continue it and it's a permanent uh, structure within the school. Okay, so let's explain a little more about what metacognition actually is, but that itself is a problem. A simple definition of metacognition is actually difficult to produce. Researchers have yet to reach a consensus regarding what the term actually refers to, with many variations found within literature. The go-to definition is attributed to John Flavel in the late 1970s, which is firmly grounded into Piaget's stage theory of cognitive development, and also can be connected to two works by the Greek philosopher um, Aristotle. You may hear definitions of thinking about thinking, deep thinking, and indeed there are a lot of misconceptions about metacognition. Um, and some people try to combine with other popular theories, such as growth mindset, and so on. Yet, yeah, John Hattie has actually demonstrated that some of these other uh, combinations actually lessen the impact significantly and indeed negatively. So, in a basic sense, metacognition is about getting things done. It's most simply defined as thinking about thinking, and metacognition refers to higher order thinking, which involves active control over cognitive processes. If we break down the word metacognition, there are two elements, meta meaning outside of or beyond, and cognition relates to thought processes. Metacognition consists of both metacognitive knowledge and metacognitive regulation. Metacognition knowledge can actually be broken down into three areas. Me, a self-awareness, for example, knowing that I'm, I can concentrate better in the library, for example, or that I can concentrate better when I'm listening to music. Uh, the task, knowledge of the nature of the task and the process and demands required. For example, recognising that I've been set an essay, uh, so I need to undertake academic research into the topic. And the strategies, uh, knowledge of the steps and strategies that will enable task completion. There is metacognition, metacognitive regulation. includes the ability to self-regulate during planning the activities and to identify when something is or isn't understood, self-assessing performance within a task and evaluating the use of metacognitive strategies and progress towards a given goal. You'll see here I've got a list of different activities. Just internally within yourself, just have a look at that list of activities and think of which one of those activities would demand more attention from you. Which would be able to
to sit down and do that. Within the audience today, I'm sure that most of you would be able to make a cup of tea without much thought process. You just go pour the kettle and do your thing. Brushing your teeth as well. I'm sure most of us now as adults don't stand there thinking about I need to brush the teeth at the front, I need to do the ones at the back. We just have our own process and we do that without much thought. Parents of young children will know it's not like that at all. Just to demonstrate it a little further, I'm going to um, refer to the work of Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Through his experiments, Kahneman created a strong metaphor into how our brains work, conveniently called System 1 and System 2. If you've read the book, please, be, please bear with me here, because I'm just going to do some experiments with you all. I'd like you to draw your attention to the screen now, and a couple of words will appear. Not those. These. A lot has just happened when those words appeared on the screen. You will have experienced some unpleasant feelings, some unpleasant images and some unpleasant memories. I heard, when I was looking there, I saw some people's face twisting and expressions of disgust and some laughing. In short, you responded to the disgusting word with an attenuated version of how you would react to the real event. If you're a school teacher, I'm sure you've got plenty of happy memories of that word. Although there's no obvious reason to do so, your mind automatically assumed a temporal sequence and a causal connection between the words bananas and vomit, forming a sketchy scenario which bananas cause vomit. As a result, right now you are experiencing a temporary aversion to bananas. Don't worry, it will pass. This complex constellation of responses occurred quickly, automatically, and without any effort. You didn't have much control in how you reacted. Let's get rid of the vomit. We've done that. And I'm now going to ask you to look at the screen. No calculators, no pens, and see how you get on with this. Okay, have we got any answers yet? Goodness, no. Okay. It's a thing of nightmares, to be honest with you. Um, did anyone get an answer to the question? No, good. Um, some of you are likely to have dismissed this question without even attempting to work out the answer. However, you knew immediately that this was a mathematical problem and that you will have had some vague intuitive knowledge of the range of possible answers. You might have quickly recognised that 8 times 6 is 48. And you may have got to an answer around that. You will know that 35 and 35 million are not plausible answers to this question. For this, you will have experienced slow thinking. The process would have been deliberate, effortful and orderly. You knew the mental tools that you required to complete the task, even if you've not chosen to go through the pain. If you had tried to do it, you would have had a physiological impact on you. Your muscles would have tensed up, Carmen says, blood pressure risen and your heart rate increased. Someone looking closely into your eyes whilst you tackled this problem would have seen your pupils dilate. Your pupils would have contracted back to normal size when you ended up your work or gave up. The answer is 5,561, but I worked it out using a calculator. So to summarise, System 2 allocates attention uh, to effortful mental activities that demand it, including complex computations 
and often associated with subjective experience of agency, choice and concentration. There are instances in life where there's a conflict between the two systems, but I'm sadly I don't have time to go through that today. In fact, some of you may be um, familiar with the cognitive load theory, which uh, seems to be out there at the moment. That's work done by John Sweller. Um, and I listened to an interesting podcast by um, John Stanier from the Dartmoor, po uh, Dartmoor Dispatch podcast recently. And if you want to learn more about cognitive load theory, I suggest you listen to that and find the link at the end. Research uh, available out there. And these are four points which I've tried to uh, conclude. That metacognition is being aware of one's own thinking and biases, taking mental steps to stop automated thinking and responses, developing an internal dialogue when question, when questions, and if, sorry, an internal dialogue with questions when faced with undertaking the task, by right, comparing and tweaking and improving automated responses. So, how can we start to implement, so that's all the boring stuff. So how do we actually put that in our classroom? Okay, so, like I said before, going back to those four Ps, um, the model which I'm going to advocate to you now um, is some sort of a metacognitive cycle which pupils can go through and teachers can go through uh, when working through any given task. Uh, I've found through all the research I've done that metacognition is actually relatable to all subjects and also with pupils right down from nursery age children all the way through to further education. Obviously at different levels and different concentrations but it is possible across the whole age spectrum. Okay, so let's have a look at this four point plan. This is um, relating back to John Favell's um, work in the 1970s, and you'll see there's basically four main elements. There's actually, a, I've actually got a fifth element as well, which follows on after reflection, which is about eight steps. Um, so we've got at the centre of each task is me, the person expected to do the task given. They've got to assess the task. And the questions which we should be asking ourselves as students when we're faced with a task are How do I feel about this task? What might I find difficult? And how could I work best? When introducing metacognition, you might actually want your students to verbalise and talk through these questions with themselves. But it's all about getting the process automated so that these questions automatically appear in their, in, in their minds when they're given a task. The next aspect of that cycle is the planning. Planning your approach. Again, internal questions such as what have I been asked to do? What do I already know about this task? And what strategies might help me? So before they get on with the actual work, they should be internalising those questions in helping them get in their head and starting the task. When they do start the task, how do they know if they're on track whilst they're doing the task? What can they do if they're not? And what could they do differently? I do apologise, I am racing through these, but um, the slides are available on the website, so I'll provide the link again at the end. And finally, once the task has been uh, completed, you've got the reflection stage, what went well, how do I know, what could have I done differently, and how can I use what I have learned next time. I said I've got to next steps, so I each also can be added on it, and I would suggest that this is um, done throughout the whole school and education phase. Next steps, how can the Students respond uh, to the feedback received. 
It's also worth having a look at how on the metacognitive cycle which students and teachers can follow given any most tasks within school. So how do we actually do that? So I'm now going to offer 12 metacognitive pedagogical strategies that if you think are relevant for the pupils who you work with, you could actually start to implement on Monday. What is key about the strategies that I'm about to show is that you don't go in and try and do a lot. Just pick out one or two strategies that you think are relevant to your students and run with them. If it doesn't work, pick up another strategy. I've actually built up a library of 16 metacognitive strategies um, taken from research and my own practice and my own work with teachers uh, globally. Um, and the ones which I'm going to show are possibly the easiest ones that you can implement and um, cut across different subjects. So, there's lots of information going to be here, so again, forgive me for the speed in this. Firstly, it might seem obvious, but explaining metacognition with your pupils. Possibly, I'm sharing a metacognitive cycle like I showed a few minutes early, and actually explain the process, even for the youngest of our students, introducing the concepts and questions that support metacognition helps their understanding. Secondly, metacognitive cueing. You as a teacher have got a huge part to play in this, in modelling your thinking, how you would be thinking with this sort of task, how you would work through the, how, what sorts of questions you'd be asking yourself when faced with this task. Again, possibly referring back to some sort of metacognitive cycle like I showed earlier. Recognising doubt. As a teacher, we've got all those faces looking from the, at us most of the time. And it's a case of recognising that moment in a child who suddenly looks puzzled where everybody else looks happy and actually picking up on that moment and trying to find out the medical issue going on with that child at that time. Reflective prompting. Uh, prompting can be a catalyst to evoke the uh, use of self-regulation strategies and you can provide prompts around the classroom um, to help um, students' thinking processes. One of the easiest strategies to use possibly is the think, pair, share um, strategy. So this is where you give the class a question, give them time to think about it themselves, say about 30 seconds, then ask them to share, discuss their thinking with a partner and then get them together to share their conclusion to the puzzle that you've just given them, explaining the thought processes. So think pressure is a quick, easy um, strategy which can be implemented straight away. Uh, KWL actually stands for Know What and Learn. And what this means is you, you label three um, charts around the classroom, asking the pupils what they know already about the topic or the question, what they want to know about the topic or the question, and then finally what they've learned. So they can see the um, learning progression um, throughout, um, throughout the whole learning journey. Uh, the last six, Thinking Aloud, and this is um, an opportunity, is that this one, Thinking Aloud, is actually quite similar to the I do, we do, you do. I was hoping to be able to show you a video today, but again, we're out of time for that. Um, so it's Thinking Aloud, you as a teacher demonstrating how you will be um, working through this problem, talking about your thought processes, and showing that with the pupils. Uh, thinking stems, again, show students, especially when introducing metacognition, thinking stems um, to help them answer internal questions about the learning. Um, with the link which is at the top there, and I'll show larger at the end, um, I've actually got a good image of thinking stems and how they can be worked in the classroom. Um, the I do, you do, the I do, we do, you do um, video, which is here, which wasn't loaded before, but looks like it's come to try and load now. 
Um, I've, I won't show it to you now. It's an American classroom in a special needs school, um, and it's a strategy where the teacher will start off trying to solve a task by themselves. Then they'll, she'll ask, or he'll ask the rest of the class to work with them whilst they continue through the task and the last stage is to leave the students to complete the task by themselves. Again, another strong point of modeling. Um, pl please watch that video, that one, um, by following the loop later. Um, another strategy available is the improve method. Um, I would argue that this um, strategy is possibly more relevant to secondary, further education and higher education students. And that, the, the um, model, is the acronym, so it means um, introducing new concepts, metacognitive questioning, practicing, reviewing and reducing difficulties, uh, obtaining mastery, verification and enrichment. Um, I've got, again, I've got more on that strategy in the links, we should look at this. Concept mapping. Um, mind maps can be used to show the relationship between topics and concepts. Um, and can show progress made within um, a topic. And I always find concept mapping is a very, um, very strong. If you do a concept mapping at the start of a topic and ask them again at the end of the topic to do a concept map, and then compare the two concept maps to show the journey that they've been on. And most importantly, I suppose, one of the medical strategies which most teachers should be using anyway is feedback. But to use metacognitive questions in the feedback um, as, a, as a prompt with pupils when feeding back on their work. So let, allow me to conclude. To be clear, um, using metacognitive approaches in the classroom needs to be a continued approach and there is no quick fix of ideas to help improve outcomes and develop such strategies. Ensuring education, educators become proficient um, of metacognition in the classroom, the classroom strategies that can help develop students is essential. Um, but we mustn't, have, mustn't fall into the trap of associating metacognition with buzzwords in and around educational communities. And the difference between theories demonstrated significant gaps between pedagogical impact scores. You may spot similarities, but these are more coincidental and tenuous than significant. Um, I apologise for how I've quickly had to go through all that lot, but I do hope that you have found this session informative. Uh, please check out this link, which should be live now. QR code there if you want to, and you can see links to uh, some of the things which I've mentioned here today, um, John Hattie's research, um, the work done by the Education Endowment Foundation, they've actually got a seven point guidance on how to implement better cognition in your school, um, the Dartmoor Dispatch podcast and the UK podcast, if you click on this tab you'll see um, further reading and research which I've um, related to. If you click on images, you'll see the slides from this presentation. And if you want to contact us uh, to support you in your school in metacognition, then you can easily contact us there. So um, I hope that you found that useful. So thank you.